Um, we're really very glad to have uh, Altasaki, um, who is very well known to many of us. Uh, somebody has done a series of beautiful things in mathematical condensed matter physics. Um, you know, I won't give a long introduction. Let, let's just mention that uh, Tasaki is the T of AKLT. Uh, um, it's by far sort of the most important paper in, in, in this whole branch of which this actually also, this talk also forms part. So, um, so Paul is going to talk about a topological index and, uh, and a general leap suit matter theorem, the quantum spin chain. So that's something very current and very exciting. And, and of course, something rooted in a very long tradition. Paul, you have the floor. Thank you. So Daniel, you want to mute and start recording or? I have started recording and uh, yes, please everybody mute themselves. Mm -hmm. So can I start? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you Bruno for the kind introduction. That's too much. And I wish to thank Daniel and Jan for organizing and maintaining this wonderful series of seminars which I really appreciate and enjoy, and also for giving me a chance to speak here today or, or tonight. So uh, like everything else in this field, uh, the topic of today's talk goes back to Elliot Leap. So I'm going to talk about a generalization of Leap Schutz Mattis theorem. And this is based on my recent work with Yoshiko Gata, and I think everybody knows her and also Yuji Tochikawa. And Yuji is a string theorist and he's very well known. And I must tell you that actually Yoshiko is the one who contributed most to this project. And of course she understands all difficult mathematics behind this. So I'm very happy that she's with us tonight. So in case I'm in trouble, I think she will help me. Okay, so let's get started. So in this talk, I mainly concentrate on quantum spin chain. That means I have this one dimensional chain and on each side, I have a quantum spin, okay? With this commutation relation. And then by a leap shoots mattis type theorem, I mean a no-go theorem that tells you that certain quantum many body system cannot have a unique ground state accompanied by a non-zero energy gap. This means, so, so this kind of situation is excluded. This means that the ground states may be accompanied by, a gap, by gapless excitation or may exhibit symmetry breaking. We don't know which, but anyway, uh, this case is excluded. So in this talk, I have to repeat this long phrase, a unique ground state accompanied by a non-zero energy gap. So I will make the standard abbreviation and they call this a unique gapped ground state, okay? So this kind of theorem is very interesting in the sense that it tells you that uh, the symmetry of a quantum system sometimes puts strong constraint on low en its low energy properties. Okay, so let me start by telling you about the original Lipschutz mattis theorem briefly. And actually I followed Andreas Winter and included some recent pictures from Tokyo that was taken by, by myself or by my family member. And, okay, so th this is the original Lipschutz mattis theorem. In this original paper, uh, they treated, Elliot and others treated the anti-ferromagnetic Heisenberg chain. It's a very standard quantum spin system with this Hamiltonian finite volume Hamiltonian, and S is the spin quantum number. And it is known, actually it was proved by Elliot and Daniel Mattis, that this Hamiltonian for even L has a unique ground state, for fi unique finite volume ground state, and it is also invariant under any rotation. So for example, it satisfies this. So this is a uniform rotation operator by angle theta about the Z axis. And they proved that uh, ground state stays exactly the same after the rotation. And what they did 
in this Lipschitz matrix is considered again the rotated state, but not this uniform rotation. They made this non-uniform rotation or twist. So this is basically the same rotation operator, but now the rotation angle here, it's constant here, but the rotation angle here is not a constant. And it starts from zero and gradually increases to two pi. Okay. So this is a twist. And since the ground state is rotation invariant to begin with, you might understand that, especially when L is large, this modifies the ground state only a little bit. And that's true. And by an elementary variational estimate, you can prove that the expectation value, the energy expectation value in this twisted state is only slightly higher than the ground state energy. So that's a variational estimate, this one. And then they went on to prove that provided that the spin quantum number is a half odd integer, then on this twisted state and the ground states are orthogonal with each other. Then uh, you can prove by elementary variational argument that there exists energy eigenvalue E, uh, which is of course higher than the ground state energy, but only slightly. Okay. So these are all statements about finite volume, but you can convert this into a statement about infinite chain. And so this is the theorem. So you assume that the spin quantum number is a half of the integer, then you see that the anti-ferromagnetic Heisenberg model on the infinite chain cannot have a unique gap ground state. So this is a no-go theorem, and this is Lipschitz Mathis theorem. And you might ask what happens if this condition is not satisfied? And then there is a very famous conjecture by Haldane. And it is strongly believed that the same model with integer spin has a unique gapped ground state. So this gap is known as the Haldane gap. And this is a very interesting problem, but I'm not talking about this today. But anyway, this conjecture or belief tells you that this condition here is necessary. OK. So this was the, this paper, these papers. This was the original. Lipschitz Mathis theorem, and there are many extensions. So these are for higher dimension, and these are slightly different. But anyway, all, in all these extensions, the same U1 invariance plays essential role. But more recently, there are so-called extensions, uh, which are similar no-go statements for models without continuous symmetry, but with some discrete symmetry. And this goes back to the famous long paper by Chen Gu and Wen. So this means that the topic is closely related to the so-called topological condensed matter physics. Okay. So um, a typical statement in this extension is like the following. So you consider a quantum spin chain with a half order integer spin. This is the same as the classical Elliot theorem, and also a short range Hamiltonian that is also translation invariance. This is again the same as the original Lipschitz Mattis. But you assume, instead of U1, you assume Z2 cross Z2 symmetry. Then the conclusion is again the same. It is never the case that the model has a unique gapped ground state. So this is a no-go theorem. So what is Z2 cross Z2 transformation? Well, it's simply the pi rotation about the three axis. So this one is the pi rotation about the x-axis. Uh, Sx stays the same, and these guys change the sign. And of course, if you combine two of them, you get the other. But anyway, this is a discrete symmetry. And um, Hamiltonian, which is invariant under this transformation, is, for example, this one. Uh, I, I'm not proposing to study this Hamiltonian seriously, but um, this is just an example. So for example, these jx, jy, and jz can be different. Okay. So this does not have any U1 rotational symmetry. So in order to prove this for this Hamiltonian, you cannot use the technique of Elliot to make this U1 twist. You need something else. 
So here are the strategies. So um, as I said in the original paper, Elliot and others used this kind of strategy. You, they construct explicitly constructed low-lying states by using this gradual U1 twist. But here we use totally different strategy. First of all, we start from the assumption that there is a unique gapped ground state and then try to derive a simple meaningful sufficient condition from this. Then if you start from the negation of this condition, then you see that this implies there cannot be a unique gap ground state. So, uh, so this is a Lipschitz mattis type no-go theorem. And this kind of strategy, I think, goes back to uh, Masaki Yoshikawa's paper in 2000. And we also make use of the so-called topological index related to the symmetry, and this goes back to Sheng Yu and Wen. Okay, good. So um, now, so I want to move on to the task of defining index for projective representation of symmetry group. And so that's dishwasher. And so um, suppose that we have a finite group which describes the on-site symmetry of the model. And everybody knows what representation is. It's a collection of unitary operators, uh, which satisfies this and yes, this one. And the projective representation is something very similar, but uh, this relation replaced by this one. And here you have extra phase factor, which is basically arbitrary, and that's taken from U1, just a complex number. And uh, this is basically arbitrary, but cannot be totally arbitrary because uh, these unitary operators should satisfy the associativity. And so if you plug in this condition to this one, then you find that these phi must satisfy this condition for any FGH. You don't have to be bothered by details, but uh, there is some condition. And this condition is known to be uh, the, the co-cycle condition. And phi satisfying this condition is called A2 co-cycle. And by Z2, we denote the set of all two co-cycles. Anyway, all, all factors which can appear here in projective representation. And here's a remark. Um, here, I restricted myself to unitary projective representation for notational simplicity. but uh, we can treat uh, projective representation that involve anti-unitary operators. That happens when you want to treat like time reversal symmetry. That's also important. But anyway, uh, for notational simplicity, I always consider unitary in this talk. Okay, so <clears throat> now I will define an index. So this is projective representation that I already talked about. And then um, suppose that I have a projective representation UG. And then from this UG, I define another U prime G by this relation, where psi G is another arbitrary U1 factor. And of course, this guy also satisfies this condition with this new phase factor, okay, which is written in terms of this phi and this psi. And I want to regard this U projective representation U prime G and U G equivalent because they are related by this simple relation with a phase factor. So this motivates us to define this uh, equivalence condition. So let phi and phi prime be two call cycles, the elements of Z2. And we say that they are equivalent with each other if and only if uh, phi prime and phi are related by this relation. This is, of course, this one with some psi. And so this equivalence condition naturally defines a quotient set, which we call H2. And this is known as the second group cohomology of the group G. And since we started from U1, so this, one, this guy becomes naturally an abelian group. And uh, so, so, and an element of this H2, the second group cohomology, which we call index IMD, uh, characterize it, characterizes an equivalence class of the projective representation of G. So this is our sort of central object. And 
one very important, so th these are all I said, uh, one very important property of this index is that you can add them. So suppose that you have two projective representations on different Hilbert spaces. So UG1 and UG2, whose indices are int1 and int2. And from this, you construct another projective representation by tensor product. And then, uh, of course, this becomes a projective representation with new, this new phase factor. So um, this tells you that, you know, you can act, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I want to regard this guy, this one as a, an additive group. So I want to uh, <coughs> represent multiplication as addition. So this tells you that the uh, index of this thing is uh, obtained by simply adding these two indices. Okay. Okay, I hope it's clear. And here's an important example for quantum spin system. So that's Z, the group Z2 cos D2. And it's a very simple group with four elements. And here I'm using a bad notation inspired by quantum, quantum information people. So actually X, Y, Z are group elements. And actually X, for example, means pi rotation about the X axis. Anyway, they are group elements and they satisfy this standard relation. And then it is well known that the second group cohomology of Z2 cross Z2 is Z2. And I want to write this as 0, 1. So the index in this case can be 0, or 1. A uh, very important example is the it's projective represent our projective representations obtained by a single quantum spin. So this is spin operator and this is spin quantum number. And uh, you set this as an identity and you set this as the pi rotation about the G axis. And then you can easily show that these guys satisfy these U1, uh, no, no, Z2 cross Z2 rule. And furthermore, if spin quantum number is an integer, then this guy squares to the identity and they, these guys, everything commute with each other. So in this case, we have a uh, usual representation, genuine representation as opposed to projective representation. We have usual representation. But if the spin quantum number is a half odd integer, then uh, we see that this guy squares to be minus identity. And more importantly, these guys, when GH are taken like this, uh, these guys anti-commute with each other. And this tells, this tells you that we have a non-trivial projective representation. So in terms of the index, uh, this is the result. So if you take this projective representation, then if spin quantum number is an integer, then we have trivial representation, trivial projective representation with index zero. And if spin quantum number is a half of the integer, uh, we have non-trivial projective representation with index one. Okay. Is that okay? So I'm going to the next part. So my next task is something non-trivial. So th this was just a projective representation exercise in finite dimensional linear space. Uh, but now I want to define similar index for a G invariant unique gapped ground state on infinite chain. And because uh, I want to start from this assumption and derive a sufficient condition. But anyway, so I want to do this. So suppose that I have this infinite chain and a ground state, a unique gapped ground state on it, and which is invariant under G. And I also suppose that there is some quantum mechanical transformation corresponding to G, and I will apply this transformation to this omega. But as I said, uh, omega is invariant, so nothing changes and I get nothing. But there is a way to get some information, that is to make a fictitious cut uh, so I pick, uh, pick an arbitrary site J and make a fictitious at, cut at site J and look at this half infinite portion of the chain and 
uh, examine the transformation property of the ground state restricted on this half infinite portion of the chain. Then, then there may, there, then this restricted ground state may exhibit non-trivial transformation property and we may be able to define non-trivial index uh, which I denote like this. Now, now, now I use uppercase I here to indicate it that this is something non-trivial. Okay, so I want to do this but it's not easy and before defining this I will discuss some simple examples. So I start from a very simple example that is Daimlerized state. I consider the spin one half chain with this very simple C2 cross C2 invariant Hamiltonian. And uh, this, is, uh, this is very simple look. So we have interaction between 2j and 2j plus one. This means that zero and one interact, two and three interact, but there's no interaction between one and two or three and four. So uh, this is so simple that you can write down the ground state formal. So, sorry, this is a formal expression, but I think this totally makes sense. But the ground the ground state is is simply a tensor the tensor product of singlet pairs. So this is a singlet pair between two j and two side two j and two j plus one. And actually, this picture here represents this kind of singlet pair. Okay, so I have this unique gap ground state. And I will make a fictitious cut here at site two and look at the transformation property of this half infinite portion of the chain. And here you only have a bunch of singlet pairs and each singlet pair is totally invariant under Z2 cos Z2 transformation. So, well, this is just invariant. So the index, index two, I, I put two here because I put, uh, I cut it, I made a fictitious cut here uh, at site two. So this index two should be, I haven't defined the index yet, but this should be zero. But this is not the end of the story. If you make a fictitious cut here and try to look at the transformation property on this half infinite portion of the chain, then uh, again, here you have a bunch of singlet pairs which are invariant and innocent, but you have an extra spin one half here. And so if you look at the transformation property of this half infinite portion, then you see this spin one half. You see the transformation rule of spin one half. So the index should be, should be one. Here's here are example for spin one chain. And uh, first consider a very simple Hamiltonian like this. Uh, this is simply SZ squared. And if you are considering spin one chain, then each spin can be zero or plus or minus. So this is a local basis. And if this is a Hamiltonian, these two guys have higher energy. So you want only to have these zeros. And so this is a ground state. You only, oh, this is a ground state, again, formal expression, and you only have zeros. Now, if you start from this uh, ground state, and if you make a fictitious cut and look at the transformation property here, uh, of course, uh, these are just zeros and they are Z2 cos C2 invariant, so you get nothing and should, the index should be zero. Here's another less trivial example of spin one chain, and this is something called the AKLT model with this formal Hamiltonian. And it is well known that uh, this Hamiltonian has a unique gap ground state, usually called the VVS state or, or the AKLT state. And so this is a pictorial way of writing, uh, expressing this VVS state. Uh, these are again, singlet formed by two spin one halves. And this circle represents uh, projection to, onto the spin one. And in this case, again, we make a fictitious cut here and look at the transformation property of this half infinite portion of the chain. And then again, in this case, you have a bunch of singlet pairs which are innocent, but again, you see you have an extra spin one half. 
And actually, it, it looks like this spin one half is strictly localized here, but it's not really true. It's kind of exponentially localized near the edge. But anyway, there is, it is well known that there is an, there is an extra spin one half degrees of freedom, which is usually called effective spin one half at, at spin one half edge spin. And so if you look at this portion, you will see the transformation property of a single spin one half. So the index should be, I haven't defined this yet, but should be one. So how should I define such an index? One, bit, one very natural strategy for me is to work on a large but finite system. And so you take a huge L and consider this large lattice and you examine the transformation property of this portion of the finite volume ground state, but, but, but this does not work at all. So the index characterizing the transformation rule of this portion is simply given by the sum of the indices for each spin. These are very simple ones. And in particular, this does not reflect the property of the ground state. So if you consider spin one chain, in particular, you see that this in, uh, index defined in this way is always zero, always for the zero for Z2 cross Z2 symmetric spin one chain. So uh, this means that, of course, this index is well defined, but it's zero for this guy and it's zero for this guy. But we want zero for this and one for this. So this simple index does not distinguish between these two states. And this is a bad news, but there is one, at least one way of defining a reasonable index which distinguish, distinguishes between these two. That is to work on something called matrix product states. So what is matrix product state? That is usually called MPS. Uh, it's a special but very important class of states in quantum spin chains invented by these people, including Bruno. And and the inventors first called this state the, the state finitely correlated states, but unfortunately this name did not become popular. But but the states, of course, become the, the states and the notion became popular and it's very standard now. So it's been used not only in mathematical physics, but in condensed matter physics, quantum information, and you know everywhere. So so this is this is very important. And um Oh, and if you, do not know, if you do not know about MPS, don't worry. So I, I talk about MPS only in this single slide. Okay, so it's a very clever way of writing a quantum spin, quantum state by using a finite number of finite dimensional matrices. Well, actually it's much more than that. But anyway, so let's, let's go. So suppose that I have a matrix product state which satisfies the injectivity and which is also invariant under transformation uh, related to this group G. And then by using the theorem in this uh, early seminal paper, you can prove that uh, this transformation by G uh, induces a transformation of matrices like this. I'm not going into details, but uh, you can prove that there are unitary matrices and these matrix are, matrices are transformed in this way. So here's a pictorial way of writing down this matrix product state. So to begin with, you have this bunch of M's and they are, it's a product. And then you make a transformation according to G and then each M changes into UMU star, UMU star. And, but this, the, uh, this actually does not change the state because uh, this U star and U, U star and U, they just cancel with cancel out with each other and you only get identity. So this is the same, this is the same state as this one. But if you make a fictitious cut here and look at the transformation property of this half infinite portion of the state, and then of course these guy can cancel with each other, but this guy remains and you will, it's like this. So you will see the transformation property uh, described by this single unitary, uh, unitary matrix U. And it is well known that UG, uh, this defines a projective representation of G. And from this, you can define a meaningful index, uh, which I denote up with uppercase IMD. 
which is the element of second group cohomology. And this kind of index was studied extensively in the context of symmetry protected topological phase and it was very hot in physics. And actually in physics community, this kind of projective representation first appeared in this paper in 2008 and extensively studied in 2010 paper by Paul Monterno, Belk, and Ishikawa. But if we look at math physics community, uh, there is a paper by Taku Matsui and in 2001, and here he considers a similar projective representation in a much more general context. And also Bruno told me that they had it uh, somewhere sometime in 20th century. So, so yeah, that, what's the history? Okay, so that's for matrix product states. And the message was that if we restrict ourselves to matrix product states, and then we can define reasonable index, which is useful. Okay, but, but we want, what we want to do is to treat a general unique gap ground state, which is not necessarily a matrix product state and we want to define an index. So we, we need an index which characterizes the transformation property near the edge of the infinite chain. And we shouldn't look at something happening far, far away. So for this kind of purpose, probably operator algebraic approach is suitable. And I think that uh, some of so, uh, you might have different opinions about operator algebraic approach, so uh, let me look at personal opinions of one mathematical physicist about this kind of approach, okay? Um, here is a student, young, naive, ambitious student, and he learned about this kind of formalism and he's excited. Hey, here's a formulation that allows us to treat infinite systems as they are. So probably we can solve many difficult problems like phase transition, renormalization and everything. And he's excited and he sort of starts reading Bradley Robinson with his friend. Actually, one of his friends is here tonight. And, but after a while he finds, oh, actually I'm sure that he was too excited. He expected too much. Uh, he finds that in many cases, physically interesting results like the existence of phase transition in the two dimensional Ising model are proved in finite system by say using the bias argument without operator algebra. Okay, so well, he expected too much, and well, this is true. And after a while, he is no longer a student, and he's a postdoc with Elliot Leap, and his opinion is now definite. It's useful for formula formulating various concepts of infinite system, but not necessarily for proving concrete results. We can work within finite system to prove important and interesting results. And I think this guy proved something like the AKLT. Uh, based on this kind of philosophy. So uh, anyway, this guy turned into this guy and that's kind of believable, uh, but time flies. And finally, uh, this guy is no longer a student or a postdoc, but he's an old guy. And now this transition is kind of irreversible. Oh, of course, this is me. This is Hal Kasaki. And now he's an old guy, but now his opinion, age 60 has changed, well, it's useful. He found the usefulness from his own work, but, also, but ba basically from the, the, this Yoshiko's beautiful work on symmetry protected topological phase. So this tells you that life is unpredictable, but I think that's nice. Okay, so, okay, 30 minutes, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm exactly on time as scheduled. So, I want to move on to this difficult task of uh, defining an index for general unique gapped ground state. Okay. So this is the core and most difficult part. And so I start by formulating general quantum spin chain. So I have this infinite chain and on each side, I have a Hilbert space whose dimension is uniformly bounded. The central object is a cyst algebra R, which is basically the set of all local operators of this spin system. And by local, I do not mean that it acts on a single, the operator acts on a single site, but the operator can act on several sites, but only uh, to a finite number of sites. And this is a completion with respect to the operator norm. 
And I sub assume that there is a symmet there is a finite group G which describes the symmetry of the model. And uh, I further assume that on each site, on each Hilbert space HG, uh, I have a unitary which uh, forms a projective representation with index J. So uh, the obvious example is, I'm sorry for small fonts, but you can read. Um, if group G is Z2 cross D2, um, I define this as a pi rotation and this small lowercase index is this. So, you know, this index with lowercase i is something very simple. You already know, or you can compute for other different groups. Okay. Now you have unitary on each side. So you can define the transformation for any operate any local operator by taking L sufficiently large. So this psi G A is just the usual transformation of an operator A. And I said this is a projective representation, so it may contain some extra phase, but here you have U and U star, so this extra phase cancel, and this psi satisfies this simple representation type rule. Okay, that's just the basic formulation. And I will look at the Hamiltonian and the ground state. So first assume, I assume that there, we have a G invariant short ranged Hamiltonian H. So this is a formal infinite sum expression. So the meaning for quantity is this Hj with the local Hamiltonian. The local Hamiltonian is a poor self adjoint and it acts on this finite dimensional Hilbert space. It acts on the site J and its neighbors. Okay. And I of course assume that each HJ is invariant under this transformation psi G. Okay, so then our basic assumption is that the ground state of H is unique and accompanied by non-zero energy gap. H has a unique gapped ground state. That is my assumption. And I want to derive some sufficient condition from this assumption. And here are very standard definition of a state, the ground state and the gap, unique gap ground state. And they are so standard that I won't read this. But if you're not, if you're not familiar with this C star type approach, then you can simply imagine this omega A as, you can simply understand this, that this omega A is the ground state expectation. So, well, so you take a series of finite volume ground state and compute the expectation value and simply take suitable L infinity limit. So this is omega A, okay? Well, if you know, of course, these are rigorous definitions. Okay, so with this setup, we want to define an index that characterizes the transformation property of the ground state restricted onto the half infinite portion of this chain. So the very nat a very natural thing to try is to look at the GNS Hilbert space. So we have an infinite chain and I pick an arbitrary site J and we look at this half of infinite portion and I define the corresponding C star algebra RJ. This is, well, this is almost the same. This is basically the set of all local operators that lives on this half infinite chain. And by omega J, I denote the ground state omega restricted onto this new C star algebra RJ. Now, if we have a C star algebra and a state on it, then we can go through a very standard procedure, uh, which you can find in any textbook in C star algebra, uh, which is called the GNS construction. By this construction, you start from this and you make use of this and construct a Hilbert space Hj and a representation pi j of this C star algebra on this Hilbert space. Bhj is the set of all bounded operators on Hj and a vector omega j in this Hilbert space. And this omega j has these properties, what are they? First of all, by using this vector omega j, uh, you can represent this uh, ground state expectation as this usual standard uh, expectation value of the vector state. And um, it is also known that if you consider vector of this form, which, be, which belongs to this, vector of this form with A running in this system algebra, then this set is dense in Hj. 
Now, given this Hilbert space, uh, we define a new operator UG, which depends on the group element G, by this relation. Well, this is simple. So I said that this kind of vector is dense in this Hilbert space. So I take this vector and I define the action of UG on this vector like this. What is this? Well, this psi G, this is just a transformation of A that everybody knows. So, uh, yeah, so, so the definition of UG is that acting on this, uh, this A simply transforms like this. So this is a very natural thing. And since this is dense, this defines, uh, this defines this UG. And by using this G invariance, we find that this UG extends, extends to a unitary operator on HJ. So this looks nice. Probably we can define index by this, but anyway, you have already, I think you have already read this punchline, uh, but you find that this UG is, satisfies this relation. So it's just a genuine representation. Uh, it's a trivial projective representation and we don't get anything like index. So this is very simple and natural given this genus Hilbert space, but this is not yet what we want. So what do we need? What do we need? We need uh, magic, a little bit of magic. A magic is represented by this simple, this, this tiny little double prime. The tiny little double prime is called bicommute and it's, a, I'm sorry, this is a magic to me. So I think for an expert like Yoshiko, Taku or Bruno, this may not be a magic, but for me, this looks like a magic. So I will explain the magic. So RJ is a cyst algebra. Pi J, RJ, I, RJ, this is a representation of the cyst algebra. So this itself is a cyst algebra and it's a subset of BHJ. It's the set of all bounded operators on HJ. And this, but, Bike commutant is equivalent in this case to the closure with respect to the weak topology. So uh, it makes this set slightly larger, enlarges it a little bit, magic, and make it into another natural uh, object called the von Neumann algebra. Okay, this is a magic. And here comes a very important observation made by Taku Matsui in 2013. Actually, uh, we call that we have used the fact that the ground state is G invariant, but we haven't used the fact that we have a unique gap ground state. So Taku's result uh, is based on the assumption that omega is a unique gap ground state. When omega is a unique gap ground state, then uh, he showed that this von Neumann algebra becomes something called the type one factor, uh, which is indeed the most well-behaved version of von Neumann algebra. Okay, then if you look at any textbook in operator algebra, you find that um, type one factor is isomorphic to the set of all bounded operators on certain Hilbert space, some new Hilbert space H scaled. So this is different. This is different from this one. You know, in this case, this, these, these guys are simply subset of this one, but in this case, they are isomorphic with each other. So in this way, so this is quite non-trivial. We, we, we have this new Hilbert space H tilde. Then the game is easy. Uh, now this is isomorphism and we have H tilde. Then one can construct a projective representation U tilde of this group G on this new Hilbert space H tilde. And the, we define the corresponding index as uppercase INDJ. Of course, uppercase indicate that this is something difficult. You have to go through something like type one factor. And here's a very rough idea of the construction. And the first part is very simple. You just define star orthomorphism gamma G on BH tilde by using this uh, UG. That is, this is just a unitary that I defined on the GNS Hilbert space. This is very elementary thing. And well, this gamma G is basically UG, UG star with this, uh, you, you can put this isomorphism, but this is nothing. So this is basically something trivial and it satisfies this. And the essential part is that you can, we can invoke Wigner's theorem and the theorem guarantees that there exists a unitary U tilde uh, on this H tilde such that gamma G is written in this way. So in this way, um, 
in this way, so this construction is not explicit, but in this way, we see that there exists unitary on H tilde, which represents G, and we can define this index. And here are basic properties, important properties of the index. So <clears throat> we have, the, this is the assumption, we have G invariant unique gap ground state, and I pick an arbitrary site J, and then we have a unique well-defined index depending on this J. And this describes the transformation property of the edge state when you make this fictitious cut to the ground state. And here are the base important, uh, important properties of this uh, ground index. So first of all, uh, this index coincides with the known index for matrix product state. And this was proved by Yoshiko uh, based on earlier works by Takumatsui, Bratkali, and Yogensen, and others. Um, but, and also Yoshiko proved that this index is invariant under smooth modification of gapped models. And actually these two properties are essential for her rigorous theories for symmetry protected topological phases. And th this is a very important uh, deep subject, but I'm, I'm not going into this one. That's too heavy for one hour seminar, so I'm not going into this. But anyway, so this is, this is what Yoshiko has done, and these two properties are essential. And actually, uh, I'm not using these. Uh, what does, uh, what do the letters MPS stand for? Oh, this is matrix product state. That's something Bruno invented. Matrix product state, okay. Matrix product state. It's a simple kind of, yeah. And so, no, so before, before some, 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 before I mentioned that we can define, well-defined index for MPS. So this is it, yeah. So we were talking, so this is MPS, matrix product state. So in this case, uh, so we, we had some previous works, especially this Paul Manterno, Belk, and Noshikawa introduced index for this case. And this has been very well studied by physicists. And Yoshiko showed that this difficult one through type one factor and so on coincides with this index studied by physicists. Um, Does this index have, have a name? Uh, no. Some, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think that it has a name. Maybe someone will Probably propose something it, at some should, point. Yeah, well, so Paul Monterno, Belko, Shikawa index, maybe, but, but Sirak and others had very something very close to it. I don't know. No, it okay, would be so, natural to call the Ogata index, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so where, where was I? So I, yeah, I said this is this, and actually I'm not using these two properties here. And, um, yeah, but, but Yoshiko always said that it's something very natural and it's very well known and it's very standard if you know operator algebra and so on. So we can discuss it later. <laughs> okay. So, and the property that we, so I talked about these two properties. The property I'm going to use in this talk is this simple identity, which whose proof can be found in our paper. But of course, this was proved by Yoshiko. So, you know, everything was proved by Yoshiko. And uh, what is this? It's very simple to understand. So this guy, uppercase int j, is something difficult, which characterizes the transformation property of this half of the portion of the chain through this type one factor and so on. And this guy is another difficult one, which characterizes this one. But if you compare this and this, this site is missing. And this lowercase int is something simple, something you can really easily compute. But anyway, these are just the same indices character which lives in this second group cohomology. So it's very natural to think that you can add this one and this one to get, get this one. And actually that is true. The proof is not easy, but you can prove it. Okay, so this is the basic thing that the, the fact that we need, and then I can move onto the final part. So the end of the day is close and I can Talk about general leap Schultz Mattis type theorems. So I recall you about setting and strategy. 
So I consider a quantum spin chain with a G invariant short range Hamiltonian. And I assume that the ground state omega is unique and accompanied by a non-zero gap. This is my assumption and the strategy is to, to start from this assumption and derive simple and meaningful sufficient condition. And then I want to get the Schultz mathis type theorem. And our main tool is this well-defined index, uppercase and J, which lives in this second group homology and that describes the transformation property of the edge state appearing in this half infinite portion. Okay, so I first look at translation invariant spin systems. So I consider a quantum spin chain with a translation invariant and G invariant short ranged Hamiltonian. And the same thing, I assume that the ground state omega is unique and accompanied by a non-zero gap. Then I told you using this picture that we have this identity. Now I use translation invariance. It means that transformation property of this guy and this guy are the same. So we have this identity. If we have translation invariance. Now, if you plug this identity in here, then it's a very simple mathematics and you can prove that this local index INDJ is zero, okay? Very simple. So um, you get this theorem. If a quantum spin chain with translation invariant and G invariant short range Hamiltonian has a unique gap ground state, it must be that index, lowercase index, a very simple thing uh, on each side must be zero. Then, uh, so this follows Oshikawa's strategy to start from the assumption of the existence of unique gap ground state. So I can convert this into a no-go theorem, lipschitz mathis type theorem. And it said that a quantum spin chain with translation invariant and G invariant short range Hamiltonian with local index J non-zero can never have a unique gap ground state. So I will copy this, this is the same thing. And this is for very general G, general symmetry group G. Uh, but if you consider the case where G is Z2 cross Z2, then uh, this theorem becomes something like this. So this condition becomes this. So you consider a quantum spin chain with half of the integer spin, short range Hamiltonian, translation invariant, and Z2 cross Z2 invariant then it is never the case that the model has a unique gap ground state. So actually this is the statement that I discussed in the beginning of my talk. And so this is now proved as a corollary of this very general uh, statement. And as you see, the, the proof was so easy after going through this heavy thing with this index. So it's so easy that you can treat a different situation for uh, example, so this is another important example, reflection invariant models. So I take a quantum spin chain with a G invariant short range Hamiltonian that is invariant under the reflection about the origin. So here's the origin, and I assume that it's invariant under reflection like this, okay? And I note, I, note, I stress that I do not assume any translation invariance here, only reflection invariance. And then, um, again, I assume that the ground state omega is unique and accompanied by non-zero gap. Always, that's something I always assume. And I have been looking at transformation property of the right half, right half infinite portion of the chain. But of course, you can make a fictitious cut here and look at this left half infinite portion of the chain and examine the transformation property to define an index. And so I denote this kind of index by this uh, index L. So this, it's the index for left part. So this, this one should be written like this, index for the right part. And now I told you everything was proved by Yoshiko. She proved in a different paper, this nice identity. What is this? First of all, um, I will recall you that the ground state is invariant under G transformation. So the whole ground state is just invariant. It doesn't do anything if you transform. Tra transform. Now this guy here, no, no, this one 
represent the transformation property of here. This one represents the transformation property of this part, and this one, this part. So it's very natural that if you add three of them, you get zero. And that was proved by Yoshiko. And now this, you know, this is again not easy to prove, but it's easy to understand and easy to guess. And then I further assume reflection invariance. So this part and this part are identical because of the reflection invariance. So I have this identity. Again, if you plug this here, again, very simple mathematics, you see that index of the spin at zero at the origin is minus twice this thing. So this means this theorem. If a quantum spin chain with G invariant and reflection invariant short range Hamiltonian has a unique gap ground state, it must be that the index for the spin at the origin must be the, the even element of the second group cohomology. Okay. So uh, this is the same statement copied. So I can again convert this into a leap short lattice type no go theorem. So the, this is a corollary. So if you take a quantum spin chain uh, with this condition, the index of the spin at the origin is not an even element of the second group cohomology. And uh, I assume that the Hamiltonian is G invariant short range and also reflection invariant under reflection, no invariant under reflection about the origin. Then we can say that the Hamiltonian can never have a unique gap ground state. So this is another type of lipschitz mattis type no gold theorem. And again, if you consider the standard case where G is Z2 cross Z2, then this condition is equivalent to the condition that the spin at the origin is half odd integer. So the statement now is that if, if the spin at the origin is half odd integer, and if you have reflection invariance, and then you cannot have a unique gap ground state. And an interesting fact about this is that you, we don't have any condition for the spin on other sides. So they can have any spin quantum number. But of course, uh, they must satisfy this reflection invariance. So this guy and this guy must have the same spin quantum number. But anyway, uh, this is something we can prove rather easily by using this uh, machinery of index. Okay, so I think I'm just on time. So uh, this is my summary. So the Lipschitz Mattis type theorem, I'm very happy that Elliot Deep is here. And the Lipschitz Mattis type theorem states that certain quantum anybody system cannot have a unique gap ground state. And the original theorem by Lipschitz Mattis makes use of the U1 invariance explicitly and makes this a uh, slow twist of the ground state. But the new theorems are proved in totally different way. We are using the topological index that classify that is used for classification of projective, no, no, index that classifies the projective representation with a symmetry group. And we also make use of the operator algebraic um, function. Okay. And this is basically the end, uh, but let me <laughs> make an advertisement. So if you're interested in more background and related topics, uh, there is a book published very recently. And actually, um, I have not seen a printed version yet. They don't send me yet, but uh, they, it's, it's available in, at least in electric form and it's called Physics and Mathematics of Quantum Medibody Systems. And I, I think you can learn background about, background related to the talk uh, from this book. And actually, I, Unfortunately, the, the book does not contain the present theorem because this one is rather new. And I also asked, I asked a manga, famous manga artist, Mario Kazaki, to draw some illustration for the book. And I, I think that's lovely. So please take a look at the book. So uh, this is again my summary. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> thank you all for a really Beautiful talk about this very beautiful work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there will be uh, questions. Yes. So, um, yeah, Elliot has a question. Go ahead. Oh, if, well, uh, if you have a question, if. Oh. Elliot? Sorry? 
Oh, yes. Well, first of all, this time, thanks for this very, very beautiful talk and very, very beautiful, unexpected result. So if I understand correctly, you don't need translation invariance anymore, just reflection invariance. Well, so this is one case. This is one case. This is one case. And yes. there is a version with translation invariance. Now, actually, it's, some, it's somewhat interesting, but so we did this in a topological way, but we, we, we do have a regional deep systematic way of doing this kind of situation. And I found that uh, it's almost in your paper with Ian Affleck. So <laughs> if I use the machinery in Affleck Leap paper, you have, you can prove something corresponding to this for uh, models with U1 cross Z2 symmetry. So it's almost there. And that's, isn't it? I don't know why, but you and others did not consider this kind of setting when you did this U1 case, but you can do, you can do the same game with U1 symmetry. I didn't mention that. So, but that I could then another, generalization would be uh, to have an alternating spin a half, spin one, spin a half, spin one chain, right? Mm -hmm. that, that would also work, right? Yeah, sure, because yeah, yeah in this that, case, That's yeah. completely new. Uh, um, but I know, guess so not, it could be proved by the old method, I think, I suppose. Yeah. But still, if it's, it's so, yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. And physically, um, these people did it. In, in, in physics literature, so. Oh, they did? Uh, yeah, they oh. did, using topological thing. Oh. So they didn't prove, you know, but, but oh. you know, from physics point, but they are very re recent, right? So 2016, 2017. And that's interesting that people did not look at this reflections thing. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. I don't see any raised hands, but so what, but you can also speak up as long as you're not competing. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Go ahead. So there are some extensions of these Lipschutz Matisse theorems to higher dimensions, and also in some cases to cases where you have, in that case, access to other symmetries like lattice rotations. Have you thought at all about trying to extend it to, to those cases? Yeah, that's very interesting. And you can ask Bruno about that too. So he did a two-dimensional case. I was going to ask um, you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very much interested in. And but now the whole thing in this in this present approach is based on this uh, index and also the notion of split state in one dimension. I didn't talk about that explicitly, but anyway, uh, almost everything in this talk is restricted to one dimension because of this split property and so on. So I, I really want, want to think about higher dimension, but um, I still don't know how to do in this, in this setting and in this strategy, but, but I don't know. So for example, um, we had a talk by Sven Bachmann in this series. So they have, they defined a kind of, yeah, they have a series of papers where they define many indices. So I don't know, probably we should look at their approach more carefully to look for further extension. But, but anyway, uh, okay, to look at the history. So the extension of, of U1 Lipschutz Mattis theorem to higher dimension was discussed, first discussed by Masaki Oshikawa and then by Hastings. And the proof was given by Bruno and Sims, and but they also gave a new proof. But so I, you know, but I still don't have something corresponding to this topological version. So you know, I want to look at that. Thank you. Bruno, do you have any comments? Um, well, it's probably it's a, a very interesting topic for discussion, and maybe Taku has comments, and Yoshiko has thought about it. I, I don't know whether we should discuss it here, why, why we, you know, where it's falling short, mm -hmm. but there's still something interesting or many interesting things to be investigated in further. Um, I mean, let's proceed with, with the questions. Uh, Jan, you have a question? Yeah, yes. So uh, recently, uh, 
there were some fashionable uh, keywords in physics literature like uh, topological insulators, uh, Kane Mele, uh, something. Uh, that, does it have relation to, to what you were speaking about? Uh, there is some relation because um, so actually my main target was not topological condensed matter physics in this talk, but it, this talk was very closely related to something called to, uh, symmetry protected topological phase in quantum spin chain. And um, it happened that what we, I did with Elliot a long time ago, which is now called the AKLT model, was a typical example of this symmetry protected topological phase in quantum spin chain. And this topological insulator is a kind of relative of ours. And topological insulator is very much different, but it also belongs to this category of symmetry protected topological phase. So it's in a sense related. Yeah. And you know, so I talked about edge, edge degrees of freedom, you know, all these edge thing is rather common in topological business. So, so we are sort of relatives. And, and you, you mentioned uh, uh, anti-unitary uh, representations, but you didn't use them. W uh, would they uh, introduce some new, new features? Not really. So that just, it just complicates the business. So if you want to treat anti-unitary, then um, you have a finite group, but you also need some function P uh, and UG can be, UG is unitary if this is one and anti-unitary if this is minus one. So the time reversal case, time reversal symmetry case is, its time reversal group is simply uh, Z2 but this parity kind of thing takes a different value. And it, with this, you get, uh, you, if this is just the usual U2 without this phase factor, then the um, second group of homology of Z2 is just trivial. But if you have this twist of anti unitary twist, you have non-trivial second group homology. So this means that uh, you can play interesting game in this time reversal group case. So, but this does not change the theory at all. But you know, it complicates. You, you always have to worry about this kind of thing. So I just, I just, I decided not to I mean, talk about this. But nothing changes in our our theorem and proof and anything. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions or or comments? Um, Anyone want to comment on, on the multi-dimensional case? I may have one, one more small question. Yes. Sure, go ahead. Um, so you distinguish between these two cases, your topological proof and the original case where you only require a U1 symmetry. So in the U1 symmetry case, it doesn't, there, there doesn't seem any natural way for projective representations to come up. No. Is there still a way to understand that case in your language or is it just somehow completely different? Oh, that's a good question that we thought about. Um, so naively speaking, so this proof does not work for strictly U1 symmetric models. So of course, if you take the Heisenberg model, it's SU2 invariant. It has SU2 invariance and SU2 contains Z2 cross Z2. So in that case, our proof works, but uh, Elliot's proof works for a model which only have U1 symmetry. And, but, and also in, the, Actually, in this U1 case, you need U1 symmetry and something called the filling condition. So, yeah, this old, older thing needs U1 symmetry. Oh, probably I don't need any more. Yeah, so the traditional one makes of the U1 symmetry plus uh, something called filling condition. I'm not going to talk about. And this new topological thing, only G invariance. So um, apparently they look, they look rather different. But uh, if we talk to guys like um, Shinsei Yu, 
uh, who works, who thinks in terms of anomaly and field theory and so on, then they claim that you have, if you take the anomaly point of view, you can sort of unify these two. And that's written in our paper, but actually I don't understand this argument very well. So Yuji Tachikawa, he's a string theorist, so he understands everything. So, he, so we have a very brief account on the unified picture uh, of which unifies these two. But please look at our paper. Well, Yuji is not here, so he cannot explain. So there, there's, it's not yet mathematical, rigorous mathematics, but you know, some people claim that there is a unified way of looking at these two. I see, thank you. Very good. Are there any other questions or, or comments? Um, does anyone want to comment on multidimensional case? Uh, what's lacking? What needs to be done? You want Taku. to. Mm -hmm. I, I want to know. I want to learn. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I, Yoshiko and I try to look at these symmetry protected topological phases in two or higher dimension. But that was not easy at all. <clears throat> there is, of course, a, a much richer type of classification that you would mm. sort of necessarily need in, in terms of more complicated objects. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so, yeah. So, but there's also some basic uh, property. What, what replaces the split property, or in what in what sense can you yeah, do you have yes, a split property yes, that yes, technically is very important here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So Spitz is saying that higher dimensional symmetry protected topological phase is characterized like, like two dimensional one is characterized by the third group cohomology and so on. But yeah, we want I wanted to put this into mathematics, but yeah, the analogous analog, analogous thing for split property was the heart. Part. Hmm. <clears throat> well, if there are no further comments or questions, then it's time for us to thank all again for an absolutely beautiful, entertaining, and, and very clear talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank so, you. applause, applause, applause. <laughs>